farm power. That's what this big meeting in Des Moines, capital city of Iowa, is called. Farm power, with ranchers and farmers from all across the country converging on Des Moines at the invitation of the National Farmers Organization. The cool green of the NFO insignia has been replaced for this meeting by a blaring red banner right behind the speaker's platform. It expresses the mood of thousands of farmers who recognize that agriculture has run out of alternatives, the usual alternatives of lobbying and demonstrating. Now they meet at Des Moines early in August to talk strategy for working together where it counts, in the market. And that's why they call it farm power. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you a man that for 10 years has headed up the dairy department, a dairy farmer from the state of Wisconsin, a man that's done a great job putting a great staff together, Ed Graff, director of the dairy department. Thank you very much. I want to briefly touch on three things this afternoon. The old marketing system, which you know well, how to affect the old marketing system, and a new system. If we want to do something, we better have a new system. First of all, the old system does two things. It guarantees the American people a good supply of milk. And secondly, it guarantees that the old system is going to buy the milk at the price that the system wants to pay, not what the farmers need, but what they want to pay us for it. What's the old system made up of? Did you ever think about it? It's buyers. It's government reports. It's the Green Bay Cheese Exchange. It's the Chicago and the New York Mercantile Exchange. It's the cooperatives. It's the dividends, market analysts, market manipulation, free trucking, test shaving on butter fat, supply and demand, and you could go on and on. That's the old system you're marketing under. Secondly, how can you affect it? First of all, if you want to affect the price of milk, Everybody in this room, from Maine to California and across the United States, in every federal order in the United States, that base price of milk is not set in those orders. It's set in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And it's called the Minnesota and Wisconsin series price. And if nothing is done there, there's no chance of getting a fair price for milk. Let me show you what it really does. This is nothing more than the average price paid to producers who sell milk to manufacturing plants in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And if I can have the lights dimmed, I'd like to show you what that's done since its very inception in 1961. That bottom line, where it goes up and down a little bit, is five years before anybody did anything about it. And the price of milk fluctuated at a maximum of 45 cents in five years. It went up and down with the seasonal production. Take a look at the rest of it. That's up through May of 1978. Something happened. There's an upward trend there from 1965 till 1968. The largest movement of milk through a new system took place in the year of 72 and 73. That is this period right there. And the base price of the milk in the nation moved for 22 consecutive months because farmers were participating and moving milk. And that went to, through two flush periods in 72 and 73. And then you see a tremendous setback. That's the old system. 
That was when the old system testified at federal order hearings to drop the price of milk over a dollar a hundred. That's the year that the old system brought imports into this country double the amount of milk fat they had ever brought in before, four times the milk solids, 55 times the amount of butter, 24 percent more cheese, and one pound out of every four that was consumed in this country, brought in by the old system, and yet we still have farmers working with them. Here's the next big drop. The Chicago Mercantile Exchange dropped the price of butter 27 and a half cents in two weeks when we had one of the lowest supplies in history. That ought to be enough on the old system. Let's talk about a new system just a couple of minutes. The new system will do one thing. It'll protect producers. It's taken 10 years to build this structure. God knows we've made many mistakes. He also knows we did the best we could with what we had. This is the new system that's ready today. And those dots on that map represent a reload structure. Those X's represent accounting offices that are all set up. We didn't have the reloads 10 years ago. We didn't have the delivery ability to move the milk that we do today. We didn't have the many good markets that you're going to know we've got today. And we didn't have the professional people that we needed and that we do have today. This organization of farmers is ready to fly. You don't have to worry anymore that farmers are in the dangerous position that they'll never have a voice in the marketplace. Some of you probably came here skeptical today. You're not going to leave here, in my opinion, very skeptical about the capabilities by the time the afternoon is over. The reason I said we're ready to fly is because an airline pilot the other day, just before takeoff, he said, folks, the safest part of your trip is now coming. The most dangerous part is over. He said, getting up this morning in your home, and going to the garage, getting in your car, and driving to the airport, that was the danger. The flight is going to be safe, and he can back it up. The statistics prove that. Your dangers are past. Your real danger was when you first talked about collective bargaining, and people said, you're nuts. It won't work. Your real danger was when the old system was convincing farmers not to cooperate, not to work together, because it couldn't work. Your real danger was the IRS, the SEC, the lawsuits that were brought against you to break your back financially in their own handwriting. The real danger was the starting of production through the new system. Would enough farmers stick together long enough till we could come to you on a day like that today and say it's all ready? Well, it's complete today. The capabilities of the organization are unlimited. The dangers of the past were brought to bear on farmers by those who chose to live luxuriously at the expense of the American farmer and rancher. The farmers and the ranchers of America are in a position today to say, we've had enough, and back it up. A member a long time, but during the interim had some very successful business experiences of his own. This time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Ralph Kittleson, Director of the Grain Department, recently named. Ralph?
Thank you, Orrin Lee. I am pleased to be part of the Green Department. It is a pleasure to work with the excellent staff, and I'm looking forward to meeting and working with all of you. The last time I was in this position, we were just beginning to develop a new marketing system. When I came back to the Green Department a year and a half ago, I was amazed at how the system had been put together and, everyone, and how much everyone had learned. So I feel like a lucky guy today because I am confident the system works and all that is needed now is a production to make it successful. As a member of the Grain Department, it is my role today to present for your consideration what has been accomplished in our department and the new system that can change grain marketing and pricing. A lot of years of work and a lot of trial and error has developed a system that we now know works for farmers. We are effective in the market. We will be much more effective and be able to price our grain with a larger volume. Allow me to show you the scope of this program and briefly how it functions. Could I have the lights down, please? The National Farmers Organization's grain system is broken down into three departments, area office management, grain accounting, and the grain department. Area office management is responsible for document control and the receipt and disbursement of member information. Grain accounting is responsible for the collection of funds from the buyer, the dispersal of those funds from, to the member through the Minnesota Grain Trust. We have seven grain accounting offices located across the country to expedite the collection of those funds and the dispersal of those funds to our members. These offices are indicated by the solid circles on this transparency, starting from the east with Salina, Ohio, Clarksville, Tennessee, Andover, Illinois, Shawnee Mission, Kansas, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Tualatin, Oregon, and Hanford, California. We also have 14 area management offices and two satellite offices located across the country as indicated by the stars on this transparency. The third department, the Grain Department, is responsible for, first, blocking the production, and second, assisting the member in the delivery of grain to the buyer. We have 25 area grain directors covering the major grain producing areas across the United States. These, starting in the eastern part, include Warren Marsh, who is responsible for Trenton, Tappahannock, and the Wilson marketing areas. Going all the way across to the western part of the United States is Ron Mattis. He is responsible for the Chico, Fresno, and the Klamath marketing areas in the states of California and southern Oregon. The next step is our county coordinator program, which many of you are, and we will need more of you in that leadership position. This is the most important step because that's where the grain is at and where it all begins. In the daily movement of grain, we handle grain in all three primary modes of transportation, truck, rail, and barge. We have barge loading points on all the major U.S. navigable river systems in this country. They include the Cumberland, the Ohio, the Mississippi, the Illinois, the Missouri, and the Arkansas rivers as shown in this transparency. We have two additional barge loading points, one in the eastern part of the United States on the Chesapeake Bay at Salisbury, Maryland, and on the western part of the United States on the Snake River at Clarkston, Washington. Our members have currently over 60 NFO collection points or throughput facilities they are, that are currently under signed agreement that are available to handle our members' production. We also have over 100 trackside loading points and other throughput facilities that are available for our members' use. What does all this mean and what good is it? Simply, the need to be businesslike. However, none of this means anything unless you understand how you fit into this program. Participation in the NFO grain program starts with a grain contract for sale. A member may commit 100% of two crop years on this one document. 
Section 1, as indicated in the upper half of this document, is for members that want to move production. That production can be committed two ways. First, either by checking the immediate sale block, which indicates for us to go ahead and move your production as quickly as possible and in the best manner possible. If a member leaves that block blank, then he's saying to us, let's put a block together and let's bargain with that block before it's sold. Section 2 of the contract for sale is for members to commit the balance of 100 percent of their production and still retain the right of making the decision of when that production is going to move. Any production that is committed in Section 2 of the grain contract for sale will not be sold until a member either gives us verbal or written authorization to move part or all of that production. Finally, you see a committed acres block on that document. We are asking our members to commit 100 percent on his new crop acres in that committed acres block. We can use this portion to counteract the government statistics that are used against us. It also gives us the opportunity to make tentative plans on order de delivery of grain in the future, because that is also part of bargaining. A member is only responsible to deliver the production that he will market from those acres. Mr. Staley will now introduce one of the first professional people employed by your grain department. We recognize that the first department that we really had to get some professional know-how because of the complicated transportation in grain, the complicated quality conditions in grain, the complication of export, the complications of so many things that we didn't realize even existed. So we started to search for a man that had been in charge of an export facility, so he knew the exporting of grain, somebody that had been in close contact with the farmers all of his life, somebody that was in top management level that would be highly recommended by that company if we could secure his services. And I learned a long time ago, the way you handle this is that when you decide in a company that somebody, there's one you want, you go to the company and say, we're not trying to raid your company, but we're going to pick one man. That's all we're going to pick. But we're going after that man. And if we can work it out with him, then we want, and you establish relationship right there that doesn't destroy relationship with the rest, or with that company or with other companies. Because you're right out front, laying it on the line, and that's the way it's done in the business circles. Fred Olson was a man we chose because of his background and his familiarity and the great confidence that many of the top executives in the grain industry had of his capability, and we always check out integrity, and let me tell you, people have either got integrity or they haven't, and if they've risen to a top level of management position and stayed there, they have to have integrity or they wouldn't be there if the company's making progress. So at this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce, for a few words, Fred Olson, who is the one that assists in bargaining and facilities and many other things. Fred Olson. He was with GTA Co-op for a while in his earlier years. He was with ADM and well-known by many other companies. Uh, top executives because of his association and work with them in many fields. Fred Olson. Thank you, Mr. Staley. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. You have just witnessed the graphic picture of our national grain structure, including receiving and loading sites where rail cars, trucks, or barges can be loaded. This is all a part of our bargaining and marketing system, but is only a part of what we recognize we must have to make it function smoothly. 
The number one ingredient, of course, is the member's grain. But also of an extreme importance are bargaining offices manned by qualified personnel. This means we must either hire professionals or train them from within. We have done both and are, and are now capable of handling a far greater volume than is being bargained for at the present time. This does not mean we have all we need for the future. Far from it. Our offices and personnel will be expanded as fast as requirements dictate. Our current bargaining offices are located at these, uh, as this transparency indicates. Clarksville, Tennessee, handling local grains from that area and some from farther north going into the southeast. Pittsburgh, Kansas, for grain in that area moving in several directions. Minneapolis, Minnesota, one of our major bargaining offices handling grain all the way from eastern Montana and eastward through Michigan and Ohio. Fargo, North Dakota, basically for grains produced in North and South Dakota and Minnesota going to local and nearby delivery points. Great Falls, Montana, for grain within the entire Pacific Northwest. Hanford, California, bargains for grain produced in California and some grain from farther north and east moving into the California area. And of course, Corning, Iowa, handles most of the grains from the so in the southwest states east of the Rockies, plus local production, and coordinates all bargaining offices. Communications between our bargaining offices is of great importance as markets and grain supplies in one area directly reflect on markets in other areas. Another factor that is important in bargaining and marketing of grain is transportation. We have one of the foremost rail transportation experts in the entire United States. His efforts have been of immeasurable value in developing our entire marketing system and in our daily operations as well. Orderly and planned marketing is the key to making transportation operate smoothly. That's making uh, the hog department change very much. This time, and I want to say something we don't recognize and a lot of people don't understand, no longer can you just put a load of hogs together weighing 190 to 270 pounds or take a choice uh, steer, a prime steer we used to call, that's out of date, that you can't take a choice steer and a veal calf and a cull cow to the same plants anymore. We've got to be able to correctly describe and go to the right plant with the right hogs of the right weight of the right quality so that that plant comes out with a uniform quality, a uniform size cut that goes through the system into the chain stores that were certain stores in the city that may be owned by the same company will get certain size cuts, a certain, certain standards that they want met. That's the system that has to start now at our collection point. It's no longer like it used to be, folks. That's the way it is, and we're out in front in developing that system, and that's the reason. In Derry and all these others, that we're getting the markets because we're out in front, and we can make changes because we're not tied to the past and we're willing to make changes. This time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Alan Scraw, Director of the Hog Division. Thank you, Arnley. Ladies and gentlemen, my remarks are going to be relatively short and to the point because we're faced with a condition in hogs which may not even be applicable to many of the other departments or enterprises. We've made a lot of changes and we've put together a program that has the ability to service any size operation and any particular type of market situation from the very largest to the smallest confinement, uh, range type, what have you. Plus, we're in position to influence the market. If we had the time, we could get into a, a lot of discussion on that, but 
I'm not going to do that at this point. However, we can't stop there because for those of you that are in the hog business, if you read the National Hog Farmer, the last issue that came out, there was an insert, and I want to quote a part of these statistics because they are significant. Number of hog farms dropped 30%. In the five-year span from 69 to 74, nearly one out of three farms dropped their hog enterprise. The 50-state loss of 191,000 farms reporting hogs left only 453,000 uh, farm sell 453, farms selling hogs in the United States. Every major hog-producing state lost hog farms in the five-year period. Ohio, Illinois, and North Carolina tied for the greatest relative loss at 32 percent. Fourth-ranked Missouri lost 31 percent. Third-ranked Indiana, 29 percent. Kansas, 30 percent. And Iowa, the hog capital of the world, lost 21,000 farms, or a decrease of 25 percent. And then you can go on with some of the minor states losing as high as 56% of their hog farms. Now, folks, this didn't happen because of the guys not being able to produce them. Because of the technology, what happened was those people, and a lot of them, got into a cash flow condition that they had no choice. They were not all inefficient, and that happened in the last few years. I'm going to show you one figure in a minute here about what the program is because since 1949 we lost two million hog farms. Now if this trend continues, and we have invited some of the very largest producers uh, to this meeting, uh, if this trend continues, at what point does it stop? At what point does your operation become inefficient and unmanageable. That point can be reached. However, we have put together a program that I want to present to you in just a, a second here, but we have built it out as the nation's most complete hog marketing and bargaining program. I guess the caption of this thing looks something like that. The hog industry suppliers do not turn on the radio to find out the price of hog feeders, waterers, farrowing crates, and what have you. There is absolutely no reason that the hog man should do it. I'm going to tell you a little story about my farming operation in Wisconsin. I'm going back to Wisconsin, and I'm going to raise the rent. You know why? Because that's the way business is conducted. It's un-American to sit in this meeting on our farms and not be able to set the price on those hogs. Yeah. Who, who in this world, any place, doesn't set their price? Think about that. It's un-American, it's unbusinesslike, it's unethical. And folks, we have to change it. I've got a plan to do that. I'm going to talk about that for just, just a minute. OK, that's the way it was. Now, looking at this transparency, these are the collection points that we have spread out across the United States. Uh, there's approximately 200 of them on there. The geography is not all that accurate, but the relative relationship is there. Now, coupled with that structure, we have put together a plan. We started out in 1976 with a commitment to bargain. That commitment to bargain, we had seven to 10,000 producers on. Uh, they believed in the concept of bargaining, and with that, we went to the industry. We negotiated supply contracts. We improved those contracts. You're going to hear about some of those improvements. And then we developed a contract for NFO hog member producers, and that is nothing more than putting the right hogs in the right plants to get the most dollars back to the producer. Now, we're at this point. One of the decisions the hog men in this meeting will have to make is do we go on for cost of production? I'm going to give you some statistics after a second here that you'll have to consider as this meeting opens up into a discussion. 
flexible marketing operations, developed written and oral contracts uh, producers, for producers to consider in extending the efficiency of their operation to include marketing and bargaining. It's a new concept in hog production that we probably never related to before, but let's take the efficiency that we put into the breeding and technology and put it in uh, to our marketing and bargaining concept. We have hired many professionals. There's 26 uh, trained industry reps that have come with the organization in the last six months that are working in the country. Their only purpose in being there is to assist you, the producer, in determining which way your hogs would be marketed to return the most dollars. In some cases, it's grade and yield. If it goes that way, then that grader is responsible to sit down with you and help you get the right hogs to the right plants so that the most dollars go in your pocket. Those graders are available at the collection point or uh, uh, by appointment by making contact with one of the uh, producers or one of the reps. Now, forward contracting. We developed a program of forward contracting because we find that the Merck is charging you for buying the contract, they're charging you for selling it, they're charging a brokerage fee, and when it's all said and done, every hog in the United States was sold there three times last year. Well, that doesn't fit the normal average producer. So we set up a forward contracting program that allows the producer the flexibility to lock in a predetermined price on his hogs that he has on the farm without having to put up margin money or margin calls. Wallert, uh, President Emeritus from, and Chairman of the Board of Dubuque PAC said that this was something that the industry had needed for a long time. But at any rate, that staff is out there for one reason, and that is to help you get more money uh, for your hogs. We give me great pleasure to introduce to you Walt Hackney, who's in charge of the slaughter cattle operation. Thank you, Orrin Lee. And I want to thank you members of the largest industry in the world today, the farmers and ranchers of the United States, for coming here to Des Moines, Iowa. Now, you're going to hear a lot today about collective bargaining and the power that it can represent for you as a national farmer. You're also going to hear a lot today about the possibilities of collectively putting together a block in volume sufficient enough to go to a processor and command and get a premium for that product over and above what you as a private individual can do on your own in your local areas. <clears throat> Those things to me have always been synonymous with the National Farmers Organization. But there's going to be a couple more terms thrown out here today that I haven't heard very much of in my lifetime as it concerns the National Farmers Organization. Those terms are professionalism and farm power. Now, personally, the term professionalism is extremely familiar to myself because I happen to come from the corporate industries, the packing industry specifically, and as a corporate person, I am a professional. A professional, quite simply to me, means um, an individual that has been selected by a corporation that he works for to be taken and schooled and grilled, to be instilled strength and, and honor and integrity and those qualities into him that give him an innate ability to go into rural America and out-trade the proud flag-flying independent American farmer. And that's the qualification I came to this organization with October 1st. The other term 
that is going to be said quite repeatedly here today, and most of you are wearing it on your shirts today, is farm power. And I can assure you that the term farm power to me as an ex-corporate individual literally sends chills up my back. And I'll tell you why. Because farm power to an agricultural corporation such as a packing industry means one thing. It means that they as a corporation lose their ability to trade with you one-on-one. -on -one. It means that they as a corporation lose the uh, ability to come to you with their professionals and trade with you as a disillusioned person who think you have the ability to trade with them and in most cases trade your socks off and balance their corporate profit pictures. Now what I'm referring to could be most ably explained by my experiences as a head cattle buyer for one of the largest packers in the United States in the West Texas Panhandle. It was my obligation to, pro to procure weekly for that corporation around 35 or 40,000 head of cattle a week. Now you can't do that going to a man with 15 or 20 head of cull cows or so forth on steer cattle. You've got to go to the commercial feedlots to buy your volume. We did put my professionals into those commercial feedlots, but we hit an impasse because we were trading in those feedlots with another professional that was selling cattle to us on a blocked collective basis of a quality and a descriptive description of kind that fit the sales requirements of our corporation. But we bought that volume from him because he had the kind and he had the volume and he knew how to sell them. And we gave more than we wanted to, but when we got done doing that, we pulled them out of there because we had to cheapen up our buy. And we put them into rural America and we put them out there on your places one-on-one. -on -one. And we traded with you as that proud independent salesman who disillusioned yourself into thinking that you had the ability to trade with that professional. And I balanced my high-priced volume I bought from those professionals by trading the socks off of you. And that's what happened for the last 20 years of my life. Well, I think the turning point possibly in my own personal career started in about 1973, possibly 74. I was sitting in the West Texas Panhandle enjoying an extremely profitable year. I had climbed the corporate ladder. I had met the goals that I had set for myself as a young man out of Oklahoma off of a cow ranch. And when I got the opportunity to trade for bucks, I did it. And at the end of the year, I got reimbursed for that job well done by an excellent bonus. But during that time, I noticed that a lot of my personal friends were going down the tube as cattle feeders. But the thing that became most alarming to me was I saw my personal family go broke in the Oklahoma panhandle because they also disillusioned themselves into thinking they had the ability to trade with my professionals and we broke them. My industry was responsible for a good bit of that and I began to have a lot of misgivings about it but I wasn't sure what could be done. I wasn't sure what could happen until I was given a choice. I was given a choice that few people have in the careers. Orrin Lee Staley called me last fall in Omaha, Nebraska, and he asked me if I would have any interest to go with the National Farmers Organization. My first impulse was definitely not. I had never found nor had I lost anything in this organization and I had no reason to go. But I took a hard look at what I'd been searching for for three or four years. And it became very apparent to me that this man was offering me an opportunity that possibly if I had gained or developed any potential as a professional, if I had any talent to give, he was giving me that opportunity to place it on the side of the American cattleman instead of against him. I took the job. I can assure you since October 1st of 1977 or in the last short 11 months, the personal gratification I've had out of this job overshadows the last 20 years in total of my life as a corporate individual. Thank you. But what did it mean? 
Orrin Lee Staley came to me as probably one of the greatest adversaries this organization had ever had. And he come to me and asked me if I would come with this organization. He said, Walt Hackney, we've developed the system. We have got it put together, but we lack that one thing we've always known we would need, and that's professionalism to make the thing work. So I took the challenge. I changed horses, so to speak, in the middle of the stream, and I come with this organization, and we put together a pro professional organization within the states that we're doing business with. Now, it's not a fast one. I haven't moved as fast as a lot of the membership in this organization would prefer. But I can assure you that I've taken it a step at a time. I've taken it a state at a time. And in those states that I am set up in with the professionalism in description and in the country solicitation, it is extremely lucrative for this organization. We do intend to continue expanding and we will expand just as long as the volume will inherit the, the action. Now, the thing that possibly would be interesting for you to know is where we have come from. I don't know what your opinion of the National Farmers Organization has been in the last several years, but mine's been pretty dim. But I can tell you where you're at today. In May of 1978, the National Farmers Organization on the west side of the Corn Belt in the Nebraska and Iowa area specifically, exceeded the USDA quoted market tops every week for eight straight weeks on fed cattle. The National Farmers Organization on the east end of the Corn Belt, specifically in the Mississippi River area, did exactly the same thing and had that same exact reputation. We also in the states of Wisconsin and Minnesota consistently, repeatedly exceeded the quoted USDA market tops on cull cows. Now that didn't come easy because in October we had to develop the confidence of the packers. We had to develop a rapport with them that we did have the expertise and professionalism to extend our product to them. But more importantly, we had to develop the confidence of you as members. You put your confidence in us. We put your market up in a collective block and we got those prices for you. Now ladies and gentlemen, all I'm talking about is that as a professional, I per personally feel that I have gone about as far as it's physically possible for me to go with this organization. I do not feel that I can exceed those limits much longer. But I can tell you what I can do to do the one more thing that I desire to do for your organization. If you will give me the extra additional volume that I require to go to these packers tomorrow and tell them that we in fact at this time do have the extra volume they ask for, that I want a cost of production contract plus a reasonable profit, that is at the time that we shall get it. Now I can assure you of one thing, this is not a mystic goal that I'm reaching for. I personally today have in my position written statements from the respective processors that we're doing business with that simply state that when I come to them with that additional volume that is significant and definite in their sales requirements, that they will in fact sit down with me and negotiate the cost of produ production plus the reasonable profit for that National Farmers Organization. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is exactly that close. We are in a position right now to control the cow market. We are controlling the coal cow market in the northern states. We have a contract today that has come from flat sheet in October to $5 a hundredweight over the sheet today. Now, if that isn't progress, I'm not sure what is. But <laughs> but I'm standing up here today in front of you as what Orrin Lee Staley calls a so-called professional and I'm making an appeal. I want that production. I want to be able to go to them and verify those written statements that they gave me back about two months ago. And I know that we can do it. But I think more importantly to you as the farmers and ranchers of the United States, I think it should be an excellent challenge. I think that you should accept it as a challenge to be able to go to those processors and get that kind of an agreement. 
It's in your hands, ladies and gentlemen, and it's up to you to do with what it, you want to do. Please turn the tape over to the second side for the continuation of the National Farmers Organization meeting for action. An urgent call that came that wanting me to be in the White House at 9.45 in the morning. <laughs> oh yes, it's for a signing of a bill, a routine thing, which they've known for several days, but it came urgent this afternoon, or about noon. They want me to visit with some of the agricultural people tomorrow. Some of you that have been in conferences and other organizations, I'm sure, are here. And I can tell you that as far as fairness and justice for farmers and for their fight, there's no compromising on my part. I have been a part of the attacks that have been made by IRS, SEC, lawsuits that have been started that have cost us about $1.2 million a year for six years. What statistics and records will show were filed for the purpose of destroying the organization financially. I've had to, in behalf of those members, call upon the people to do things financially that I participated in, I'm sure, as heavily as anybody, almost at least, and every one of them, to reach the day that we have here. There are going to be those that say that when we talk about farm power, that that farm power is being advanced because Staley wants power. I can tell you that nothing could be farther from the truth because I'm intelligent enough to know that farmers are never going to give anybody in agriculture power over them as long as they have a choice. I have to say a few words of my philosophy, which I have never said. But today, this is the most important day of my life, and I think of yours. I had a few things that I said, not that I ever wanted to become involved in agricultural leadership. I have one love, and that's a farm that I was born on in northwest Missouri. That is now operated by the son and the wife, the fourth generation. That that's where my love is. That I am proud of that family. That never caused me any sleepless nights while other families have had sleepless nights. I couldn't have done it without that type of support. So I really can stand here today telling you that I have only one desire. I worked for some years without any salary, expenses, part of the time. There wasn't any glory. There didn't look like there was anything. But I had a belief and others had a belief. And so, they've had me tied down administratively in the last few years, fighting lawsuits, taking all of my time, and administratively putting together a system. And now I'm going to be among you, out in the country. Because you don't know me, it's only what you've heard. It's not all perfect. I'm not trying to say that. I made plenty of mistakes. But I and all the rest of us did the best we could, and we never quit doing it. And I pledge to myself 
that I would never stoop to the criticism of individuals, that I would stay on the issue. And I don't believe that there's a person that has opposed me that can say that on the convention floor I ever attacked anybody personally in any way. I've kept the doors open. I didn't want to stoop to it. I made another resolution in my mind that I would never defend myself. If the job wasn't done well enough, then I'd simply say I did the best I could. And I always closed every convention. I'm saying this because many of you don't know it. I meant it. That I didn't believe that anybody should politic in a cause of people. Whoever is the best that could do the job is the one should be selected. I only say that because I want to touch on another thing. This organization is set up so you can have a voice. You can become a member tomorrow. You can be elected if you have enough votes in your county because it's county to national convention where you can make the policies, where you can have a part of the highest authority in the organization and the decisions that are made. It's been a long, hard battle. Now I want to tell you that those that have been in the long, hard battle, many of them, have told me to say this to you. Don't take the NFO for granted. We're willing to fight with all the vigor that we've got and all the strength we've got. But we can't do it without a lot of help now that the systems and the structure have been put together. And I don't believe that anybody can say, hardly an exception, that now with our system that we haven't been as members getting the best price available for cattle. That applies to hogs in most areas. And we're ready now to break dairy wide open, the dairy program is now available because there's only certain key markets and we couldn't get those to start with. We had to haul milk a long ways, 50, 60, 70 cents, 100 transportation, to the markets that we didn't really want. Today, those markets are opening up. And if you put the production together, we'll get those markets and others will have to haul instead of us. And we'll beat them on price. I became convinced six years ago or seven years ago that there would never be enough people that would philosophically stick together long enough feeling that they had to take below market price while they were building bargaining power. That we had to outdo the old marketing system itself in the delivery of production in the getting the right production at the right plant at the right time and services, as well as volume. I don't have any magic solution for you today. I'm sort of like the minister or the priest has the same Bible, you know. And about the only thing that they can tell you is that hell's over the hill, you know. And they have to remind us all of that. And they have to remind us because we forget. And probably most of us wouldn't go to church if it wasn't for the fact that we were afraid they were right. You know. And so I've got to say where I think agriculture is right now. I truly believe, and I've never been one that was an alarmist, I tried to present the facts as they were or are, but never once saying that we could do anything for people. The power you've got to establish is a power for yourselves. That's what we're talking about. The NFO is only a vehicle, the National Farmers Organization, a new National Farmers Organization. Why? Same goals. But it's new because now we have the systems and the structure. Many of our members don't know it. They're behind times, and very few of those that are not members know it. 
We've tried to lay it out to you today. I want you to think for a few moments of the alternatives. What are we going to decide here today? What are you going to decide? I'm only going to lay out something that I think that the decision should be made around. One, do you want a legislative program? Personally, I think it's time that Washington came to the farmers instead of the farmers going to Washington. I think that the dangers of pursuing legislation that we have hopes that's going to get us a fair price. It's been done for a century now, folks. And now we represent 3% of the voting population. I hear about bills and read them that have been introduced to establish a farm board. I think it's the most dangerous thing that could even be presented. Why? I can tell you the history in every state, and you know it, where there's an agricultural bill of importance, and in the federal government, immediately, the business groups and the consumer groups, from the environmentalists on, always feel that they have to have a part of the decision in, in farm policy. General Motors doesn't let them decide that for them, nor does George Meany let them decide it for labor. But if you establish a farm board, they have the votes in Congress to amend it. And by legislation, they could decide by amending it. And they'll be in there to start with, and it'll be amended. And by law, they could decide the, the price you're going to get for your products. That's the danger. The other danger is that if we think that Congress is going to give us any more than a bare survival, and they're even going to be behind time on that, with the inflation costs, inflationary spiral. I'll tell you what's going to happen to you. If you get farm legislation that's meaningful when the consumer interests can point to the fact that their congressman raised the price of their groceries at the checkout counter of the supermarket, the bill will be amended, the law will be amended, and you know what will happen? You'll have an anti-farmer Congress overnight. And there's 400 of those in the House of Representatives and 35 people in the House of Representatives that have good farm interests. <coughs> I don't believe we ought to take chance on those odds. I also know that we started out on the legislative program. We became convinced then it wasn't going to be done because of the swing, the obvious thing. We're fooling with dynamite, and we're going down the same road that's been gone down for a century. And always some crumbs for the farmers, but just the crumbs to keep them in survival. And I personally don't believe that we ought to get our prices in Washington, D.C. I think we ought to get them at the marketplace. I believe that there is a place for legislation. I don't think there's anybody got a farm legislative office as good as Chuck Fraser heads in Washington, D.C. Many of you have been there. You've seen it. But on the Capra Volstead Act, taxes, many other things, and whatever we can get in support price levels is fine. That's a minimum. But if we go to the marketplace and they say there will be a tax on the Capra Volstead Act, and I believe them, our counterattack should be if they're going to keep farmers from pricing their products, then let's amend it so General Motors can't price their automobiles and so labor can't bargain for their wages, too. And I think on the economic front, we'll have a change very quickly to our side. 
I think we have to decide number one here today. Do we want a legislative program? Do we want to go to the marketplace and use all of our strength to develop our farm power, your farm power? Not mine, not the board of directors, not the NFO. This is something you can say to every producer. And when they talk about farm organizations pulling together, we've pulled together on the legislative front. But I don't know of anybody else that even got a structure started that can give farmers the opportunity in a few weeks' time to price their products and be able to deliver that production under contract. You've got to have it. I haven't been one to be critical of others only on issues, not in the personal domain. I wish that we could have put this get together faster. There are those of you in the audience that were rightfully critical, that we were bumbling and fumbling, that there were mistakes being made, that we need professional people. You know what? I couldn't say that I agreed with you at the time because I didn't know what to do. That's a frank confession, folks. I didn't know what to do, and nobody could tell me. But I'm proud of the professional people, piece by piece, that we put together. Maybe somebody else could have done it faster. But together, we've got it done in what I consider the nick of time. And now I want to say something that is going to be a shocker, that I believe that in a couple of minutes I can prove. This may very well be, and I believe it is, the last opportunity of free and independent farmers to remain free and independent. There are now adequate proofs that in the early 80s, written by the top financial publications that go to selected people, to say that there will only be 250,000 farmers by the early 1980s, two, three years from now. I believe that that is going to come true if we don't go out of here determined to stop it, determined to prevent it. And you know what's different? The CED, all the other things that have come along. Farmers said, yes, we're going to take over our neighbor's farm. They said, we're going to survive. And I've talked to them, many of them afterwards, that said so proudly they'll never get us. Three years later, I met them, and they weren't in farming. But they've, everybody has consoled themselves, it won't be me. And millions of farmers have gone. But you know, that only means one out of seven or eight that'll be there in two or three years. Now look at your own community if you don't think that's right. If you look at your own township, you will find out that in most townships, there's not over 10 farmers because of the age factor and the financial capabilities, the ability to borrow will even amount to much in production two or three years from now. Yes, there will be farmers that will be living in their homes, somebody else operating their land as they retire, and they won't move, sell it until they pass on. But that's no longer going to count. It's not going to be there. Now, if you think you're going to be one of those 250,000, let me tell you what you better do. You better line up a banker that'll give you at least $2 million credit. And you know what? You are no longer going to be free, independent farmers. You are going to be financially controlled then by structures that are already set up and being set up. First, there will be a farm management advisor that will be representing the lending agencies. There will be a computerized system who experts who probably never saw a farm will look over the statistics and see where you lost money. 
not knowing what the factors, maybe even the costs. But if you continue to do it, the financial institutions will pull your credit. And that's the reason I believe, unless we do it now, that this could very well in this meeting be the last chance for free and independent farmers to remain free and independent because government programs are going to only give you bare survival and they're going not to do that because of the inflationary costs. Do you realize that the agreement in Bonn, Germany, where the Germans and Japanese that the President agreed that by 1980 we would raise our domestic crude oil production price up to the world market price, which now would be about $5.80 a hundred of a barrel, crude barrel, to the $13 market level of world prices. That was forced on us. That has been agreed to. And that is a reality. That's a part of the expected increasing and increasing costs. It's going to take more money. There's about $450 billion free money in the world, investment money, that can be put in anywhere. Foreign corporations, buying land, many other things. The fight is on many fronts, folks. And it's going to take a United Farmers effort to change that. And so I think that, number one, you have to decide. Do you want a legislative effort? I've given you my opinion. It doesn't de-emphasize. Sure, we'll do all we can. Work with others on whatever may be feasible or possible. Do we want to make the all-out effort you're the ones that's going to have to do it to unite the production. You're going to have to do it. I can't do it for you. You're the ones that's going to have to do it. You're going to have to decide whether you want to. Thirdly, if you don't want to, and you're not going to do it, and I've stood and heard applause at conventions, as I gave what some people called an evangelistic speech and some called a rabble-rousing speech. I'm not trying to give that to you today. I'm not trying to build you emotionally. I'm trying to do it in a business-like way. You have to make the decision. But if you're not going to do something, tell us so we can go back to our farms too. Don't take NFO for, a gra for granted. There's too many people that have put in a lot of work. They're proud of where you were at, but we can't butt our heads against the stone wall. I made up my mind a long time ago that what had happened to most farm leaders was that they became disenchanted, disturbed, frustrated, and ended up from being what people called at least liberals or whatever they wanted to call them, more names worse than that usually, to where they become arch conservatives and embittered people, embittered people. You're not going to do that to me. I'm strong enough that that's not going to happen. I never worried about being president of the NFO. I always had confidence in myself to make a living for my family. I never lacked that confidence. Whatever ability I have, I have given wholeheartedly. There's nothing more that I want to see in lifetime and right now, and that is farmers pricing their products. That's So if you think that you're going to hurt me or somebody else, I'll tell you who you're going to hurt, yourself, your families, your community, and your country. The dollar situation will never be corrected 
In my opinion, I can't understand the economics of this country and the economists. You got to get enough dollars back from what you sell to equal those dollars that you pay for what comes in. And you know, $5 wheat brings a lot more dollars back than $2 wheat. I said that to the Council of Economic Advisors and the Budget Bureau at the White House level. Some people who may be here that heard me say it. I said, my mathematics may be poor, but it seems like that's two dollars or twice on some dollars received and some two and a half at times. They're not going to listen. They've got some type of economic theory that you just as well talk to the wall, unless the people in this country change. There's one other thing that I think is bad in this country, and I recognize it and I realize it. We're in the most difficult times of leadership that this country has ever known. With the Watergate issues, everybody lost confidence. With the present impression that the Carter administration is indecisive, people that had hope again are losing hope. So it's no use of leaders trying to really establish leadership. All you can do is the people have to establish that leadership, and I know nowhere but among the agricultural producers of this nation that that leadership can come because they can communicate and they can be free at this point. The other, this crowd, certainly of 10,000, you're seeing it with the floor filled and those in the balconies. We didn't depend on anybody to get the crowd here, and I'm not critical of the press. Some people are blaming the press for everything that happens. I think we, of course, have got an astounding crowd. To get 10,000 farmers together now with a number of farmers indicates strength, but it was done through organization through personal contact, through a system. And we used to have a system that we could, in six hours' time, contact every farmer in this country by word of mouth. That system's a little rusty, but it's got to be rebuilt, and we got the CBs to add to it, you know. We got even a faster communication system. And now, if I keep such a low key, why the, the press will probably write but Staley's lost his vigor and his will to fight. I'll straighten that out in a couple minutes concluding. <laughs> and I'm not critical of the press. They've done a fair job for us. A lot of times they don't understand, but neither do farmers. So they're, they're no worse than the farmers. But I think we got to decide then, and I'd like to say two other things when you're deciding. I think we've got to go out of here with benchmarks, goals. I think we've got to go out of here with a goal of increasing our volume through our commodity programs 50% by the first day of September. That's not going to require too much. A semi-load of hogs extra from a county Maybe a load of milk is about what it requires from the counties. It's all there. Grain is not as easy. You know what? If we don't get grain stored at harvest time, we're going to kill the grain market for the next four or five months if this crop develops. We'd better learn that grain program requires two things. One is having your own storage at harvest time so you don't dump it on the market, and the other is moving it in orderly marketing. Decide if you're going to sell so many bushel in five months that you're going to do it on an orderly basis, and you'll get more net dollars in trying to pick the high day. You're not that smart, and neither are we. But the law of averages will do it, and you can raise your prices because there's one reason that the NFOs fought so hard. We can start activity in an area, 
We think nobody's going to hear about it hardly. Every buyer of every commodity knows that activity there means that production is going to move away from them. <coughs> Boy, do we get attacked. But you know what? They bid up to keep it from happening. And when they do it, and we're doing it everywhere, then we are raising the general price level. And then we've got to contract ahead to keep just part of our production so that we can maintain the gains that we've made. The other is holding action, strike. It's going to be different now, folks. We cannot do it as we used to do it. You've got confinement feeding in hogs. You've got big feedlots. You've got milk with big volume. You've got to have a plan. You've got to show them what we're going for and they've got to know and understand, or you won't even dimp the volume. You've got to have a structure that every one of those producers has contacted. He knows that we have the expertise to sort his hogs to go to the right place, that we can prove that we have people that can do that the same in cattle, that the right outlets in dairy are there, and we'll get their support. But if we don't have the production going through a system and you had a holding action or a strike tomorrow, what have you accomplished? We fought for recognition with our early holding actions, and we fought for written contracts in the last one. We got all of that. So we can have a strike or a holding action tomorrow and say that all the farmers supported us, so what? How are you going to maintain it? You've got to be able to have a system to deliver the right hogs to the right plant, the right cattle to the right plant, deliver the grain either for domestic or export with all the transportation, the accounting, collecting from the companies. And you better have a credit department to be sure that the companies can pay too. All those things are there. They have to be. It can't be done any other way in my opinion. And so I'd like to see us come out of here with goals, no goals, determination. Now we're going home, and you know, if the people here, if every one of you participated and you got two more your size, I've been assured by the bargaining departments that if we increased our volume 50% right now that you wouldn't know dairy was the same ball game. We would move production into those markets, and others would have to haul out, and everybody will be fighting for the markets, and we'll raise the price. The 50% increase on the hogs will do the same, and 50% on the cattle. That's not near enough, but it'll have an effect. We've got to set goals that we can reach by the 1st of September. There will be a convention in December and between that time and convention, the Board of Directors could agree on goals to reach further steps. And then we would like to recommend that there's one day that used to be known and is still known as moving day in this country in rural areas, and that's March 1st. We'd like to be able to move into cost of production plus reasonable profit contracts on moving day next spring before another crop goes in. But you've got to start somewhere. You don't do it all at once. The system, the people are there. You're the ones that's got to decide. What does that mean? I think in conclusion, we all recognize that you can't be successful in one commodity. You have to be on all commodities, because if you were successful in one commodity, it won't last 12 months. The others, the switch in production will kill it. 
The other thing is, I've talked to the company presidents, and when we say that's what we're going for, they say we don't care. We're not concerned about what we pay, it's whether our competitors can buy cheaper. And the answer is this. We put 30% together, then we'll be able to deliver to places not more than 100 miles apart. That means right in the middle, 50 miles. And if somebody tries to buy it cheaper, we can move it to the points of delivery, and then we've only got the transportation out, and they'll have to raise their price to that level, or the producers will come to the organized farm effort. Farm power. In conclusion, before you make the decisions, we're going to abide by the decisions. This is an unusual meeting. 13, 14 microphones around. I'm sure that somebody's on them that will man them. All set, isn't it? They got numbers on them so that everybody can see them, right? You're going to have your say, I hope we stay on one subject at a time, but I know that's not possible, to throw it open to 10,000 people to decide what their decision is going to be would be impossible. But now all I want you to do is to think of the conclusion. Now I want to tell you what happened. I believe, and this is to be sure that my image is not low-keyed too much, you know, that I've lost my will to fight. I'll take a couple minutes in conclusion. I don't know what kind of a leader people expect in this country. If you're low-key, they say you aren't aggressive. If you're aggressive and dynamic, they say you're trying to get power, you know. So I don't know what you say. But I really don't care. The NFO, the National Farmers Organization, today has committed to no one. There's been no under-table deals that bind us in any way. We're free to make our own decisions. And I am proud of that fact. And we have the courage to let you make the decisions. And I wonder if any organization in this country, agriculture anywhere, would dare do that with all the ideas that everybody has. The other thing is the will to fight. I want to see us give the companies of this country an opportunity to sign contracts at the cost of production plus a reasonable profit when we have the production going together and united. And if they don't, I'll be the first to call with a dynamic, loudest voice that I know how that we go on strike or have a holding action until the food's not available to the people in this country until they pay the price. And if it comes to that point, we'll hold a press conference announcing the strike or holding action. I don't care what you call it. And I want to congratulate American agriculture for doing something that had never been done. And that is that more people were committed to the word strike than anybody thought would ever be possible in this country. They didn't run to their closest sower two years ago if you use the word strike. The meaning of that is that more people are committed to the word strike today than ever before. If we'd have used that in the beginning, everybody would have stepped up their accusations that we were a labor organization, you know, which we never were, and which it's very clear in law that it has to be an organization of producers that cannot be tied to any other group. But if it comes to that and there's a strength, but I'll tell you, don't look to me to be the leader of that effort if you haven't put the production behind it because I'm not going to go out hunting an elephant with a BB gun. Find somebody else. But as a last resort, 
When we've put the production together and bargaining is pretty simple in the process. Just put enough together, companies can't fulfill their needs from other sources. But there will be one press conference, it'll be so well organized, if we have to go that way in communications organized, till there'll be a press conference and I want to be able to say one, two sentences. Number one, I'm going fishing while the farmers are on strike or holding action. And secondly, when the people start running out of food in New York, San Francisco, and Chicago, I'll be back for another press conference. Thank you.